Welcome to episode 501 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and apologies for the delay on getting this out. As you can hear in my voice, I'm a little under the weather, so I don't have a guest, so I don't have anybody to talk about this stuff with me, but... Today is kind of a big show in terms of what we're going over. That is the Champions League draw, and that is the three teams that Barcelona will be facing. We know who they are, and we know when they are. And then it's full steam ahead because deadline day was yesterday. And while we're going to have a little bit more on the changes and things that kind of go through between player to player, I do want to give what I do every year and give those grades for each individual move in and out, and some Barca athletic players as well, as to what grades that the club deserves and what grade I think overall that those moves are for both the player and the club. First, before anything else, let's get into the Champions League. Barcelona are in Group H, and they're facing Shakhtar Donetsk, Porto, and Royal Antwerp in Belgium. So I think first and foremost, the takeaway from this group is the obvious. I have nothing more to share with you, and that's the fact that Barcelona should, on paper, they should win their group. On paper, a lot more talented than all three of the teams that they're facing. And in the cases of Shakhtar Donetsk and Porto, these aren't even particularly strong versions of these clubs compared to other seasons over the years. So I figured we'd just do a little mini preview here. And of course, I'll be previewing these three teams a plenty more when we get closer to that time. As I said, this isn't the strongest Shakhtar Donetsk team we've seen, at least on paper. I don't see in this team that Ukrainian wonderkin that they usually have, or even the Brazilian future star that they're trying to create who's 20 through 22 years old. Their best players are center back Mikola Matvienko, the attacking midfielder Georgi Sudakov, who's 21, the attacking midfielder Artem Bondarenko, who's 23, the defensive midfielder Taras Tepanenko, the captain, who's 34, and then there's a 22-year-old center midfielder who is currently leading in goals. And again, it's early sample size, but that's Dimitro Kriskiv, who's 22. And then, of course, the center back making his quote-unquote return to Catalonia is the old center back, Dimitro Grzyzniewski. Now, it is early days in Ukraine in the Premier Liga, but Shakhtar Donetsk do find themselves atop the table with 11 points from five games. But you compare that to rival Dinamo Kiev, who only have played three games where they have six points. So again, too early for anything like that. Now, the club did make a lot of money last season selling Michaelo Mudrik to Chelsea for 70 million with add-ons. Plus, they also sold David Neres to Benfica for 15.3 mil and Dodo to Fiorentina for 14.5 million euros. They also sent old Barca B center back Marlon to Fluminense on loan. He is 27 and that does sure make me feel pretty old. They also sold their starting goalkeeper and didn't truly replace him. And as for who they brought in with that money, it was more youngsters, two 18-year-old left-wingers from Brazil, Norton and Iguinaldo, and left-back Arakli Azaravi from Red Star. So pronunciations on all of those names were probably butchered, as you know is the point. But as we get closer to, hopefully I do a little more homework on Shakhtar Donetsk and get those names right. They also have a new manager in Patrick Van Leeuwen, who took over at the beginning of July. So a lot of change for Shakhtar Donetsk, and it is a team that does, especially with everything politically going on, in that country at the moment. It is a team made up primarily of Ukrainians at different parts of their career. But as I've reiterated many times before, this is not the best version that we have seen of this team in the Champions League. But hey, who knows? Maybe that underdog status makes them even more dangerous. Next up, Porto. They should be the biggest challenger to Barca's winning the group, but I still think Barca on paper are much better than them. Diego Gonzalez is the big story. He has jumped right into Sergio Canseco's starting 11, and it could be a big year for him. My favorite player of all time, with a lot of sarcasm baked in there. Pepe is still around. He is 40 now and still the captain, still starting games. And I would love, of course, to put a few past him. Obviously, that goes without saying. The goalkeeper, Diego Costa, is one of the big names, as well as Brazilians Pepe on the left wing and Evel Nielsen up top. The starters up top so far, though, have been Tony Martinez and the Iranian striker Mehdi Taremi, who does put up good numbers. Some other intriguing pieces in the team are Alan Varela, yes, the one that I liked at Boca Juniors and I thought could be a quote-unquote replacement for Sergio Busquets. He was bought by Porto for 8 mil, so maybe I ranked him a little higher than the rest of world football did. Marco Grushik, who has been around the defensive midfield of a bunch of teams in Europe, played for, I think, Liverpool was his most famous stop on that journey, but again, still just 27. And then a 20-year-old right winger, Gabriel Verón, who was a huge prospect for Palmeiras a few seasons ago as a 17-year-old and was bought by Porto for 10.3 mil. So as expected from Porto, a few projects that could make them a pretty penny in the future. But as I said, this still feels like a team on the rise. Yes, they have a player like Taremi. So you do take seriously the fact that they have a bunch of veterans who do know how to find results. 
and you cannot take Sergio Canseco's starting 11 for granted. Certainly not. To World Antwerp, they should get last in the group. It is still early days, but they finished third in the regular season in Belgium last year. They won the championship round then, qualifying for the Champions League after the qualifying round against AEK Athens. And this season, they've got off to a ho-hum start in four games with two wins, a draw, and a loss. And they sit in seventh right now, but that is still too early. How they got to the group stage is very exciting, though. Toby Alderweireld of Tottenham and the Belgium national team fame scored the goal at the death to send them through. He's returned to his former club and serves as their 34-year-old captain, and he'll be the big name that everybody knows. Aside from him, Vincent Janssen, formerly of the Eredivisie and then Tottenham, he is the starting center forward, and the player Kules will be watching is one of the two double pivots. That's 18-year-old Arthur Vermeeren, who, just like Varela, was one of the many players linked to the pivot role in the last few months for Barca. So for Barcelona, taking on two of the, I thought, top 10 on that shortlist, and with many of those players that I also on that shortlist heading to Chelsea for big money that Barca will never be able to afford, it kind of is interesting that they may be able to scrap that they might be able to scout some potential players that have been on their list with this group stage. And then the midfielder in front of that double pivot and probably the man to watch for Royal Antwerp is Jurgen Ekelenkamp, a former Ajax player who isn't playing the level he might have thought when he was a big prospect coming out of Ajax a few years ago, but still in his early 20s and still capable of pretty good football. But again, listen to those names. Janssen, Taremi, Matt Bianco. Those are good players, but I don't have anything different to tell you about expectations. Barcelona, I think for Xavi's job, not to say that second place in the group will be the end of Xavi, but certainly if Barcelona did not win this group, I think everyone would admit around the club that it will be a disappointment. Barcelona should not only qualify for the next round, but they should get first in their group. With these teams, as I said, Porto, Shakhtar Donetsk, not as strong as they usually are, and Royal Antwerp, that is a team without Champions League experience, so you have to take it to them early and put up the goals there. And use those games even as a springboard for young players to get confidence in Europe and for those players who are on the fringes of the team to get some minutes as well. You don't rotate in the Champions League, and I do think the Xavi, even though the opponents are who they are, I think Xavi is going to go all out with the starting 11s in the Champions League to send a message in Europe, because as crazy as it sounds, that game against Royal Antwerp, is going to hold more weight than a win against Sevilla or Real Betis or Real Sociedad or Athletic Club. It's just the way it is, the way that Barcelona have failed in Europe recently, and that is certainly something that they need to rectify. So moving over to our main course, the grades for all the transfers in and out of FC Barcelona over the summer. I'll also be doing a few of the notable Barca Athletic players too, because I think we may see some of those faces around the first team this season due to the sheer number of players that exited this week. First, for the first team, as I said, we go through the grades. That's the American grading system. So sorry to everybody, but the way Americans grade, it's A+, plus, A, A-, minus, and then you do it with B, C, D, and then you jump straight to F, and there are no F pluses or F minuses or anything like that. Also, by the way, didn't hand out any Fs this season. I don't know. I felt like everything was just fine enough not to hand out any Fs. But first, let's jump in right with a grade A. Ilko Gundogan, free transfer from Man City, 32-year-old, gets an A for me because, as expected, comes to Barcelona, was done early in the window as well for a free transfer, decided to say no to Man City, having just won the Champions League with them a season before. So a good move. Even for a 32-year-old, you know you should be getting a few years out of him, good years out of him as well, and he's still a top-quality player. You bring him in, again, free of charge. That makes this an A, maybe even A-plus in my book, but the reason it's not an A-plus is because we do have a small enough sample size where... I will take an adjustment period, I think, for Gundogan that we didn't necessarily expect, but I don't think he's fully firing on all cylinders just yet in Xavi's system. And with Pedri out, we may have another month or two to wait until those two are really starting to click. And Igor Martinez gets a B plus for me because it is a free transfer. It is a free transfer of one of the better center backs. I'm not getting all snobbish about this. I've been watching enough athletic club through the years that he is one of the better center backs in the league over the last 10 years even. So you do bring him in. He is 32. He historically has not typically been injury prone, but he's now already been slapped with that label because once you're in your 30s and you cannot seem to stay healthy, the only thing I will throw at him is that this was a major injury for him. So it's always a difference between those little nagging injuries that players pick up. I mean, like in Araujo, where Araujo has never gone for more than a month and a half, two months, three months, but it seems like he's constantly getting that every few months. And same thing with Pedri. It was never anything major, major that keeps him out for a long time. But it's all those little things. For Nico Martinez, I don't know. I feel like this injury might just be a one-off thing based on how often he's played for Athletic Club through the years. But again, I give this a B plus because that is an upgrade. 
over what they had in their backups at that four center back spot. So that's a B plus. And I do think he's going to have some good minutes and be a quality, again, left-footed center back. So also important to having a natural left foot on that left side. And yeah, I expect that Kool-Aids are going to exactly what they would expect from him, which should be a B plus. Or Romeo for 3.4 mil, actually the only transfer fee the Barcelona spent in this window to tell you about FFP. We'll get into that at the end. But coming over from Girona, he gets an A for me because already he's exactly who we thought he'd be. And as I said with Girona, having watched them a, quite a few times last season, if he could fit in, and I use air quotes on fit in, if it could make sense, you could understand why he was there, the player that he was for Girona last year. If that's who Barcelona was getting, that is a home run, uh, to use another sports analogy, but that is a home run grab for 3.4 mil. He's just a quality defensive midfielder, good enough for the Liga. Some questions in Europe, of course. Villarreal stretching them out and figuring a few things out. And no, he is not Sergio Busquets. He does not have the quality of Sergio Busquets. He does not play those long balls. And you do have to kind of rearrange your team to deal with the deficiencies that he presents that Busquets did not. Sure. But Orlando is a good player. And again, not a great player, not a legend of anything, but even at his age of 31, he'll be 32 in about three weeks. Still really happy with that deal. I'm happy that he was the man over the other picks of those experienced defensive midfielders that they had. He was my pick, and it looks like I got that one right. So of course, validation-wise, I give that an A, and I give my pick an A too. Jao Cancelo on loan. The reason this gets a B for me is because, yes, he's a right back, but because he's just an attacking right back and because of his history with the locker room stuff... This could possibly go wrong. Not only could it go wrong for Barcelona, but because it's just a loan, they cannot use him as an asset in any way. So if he winds up not working out, then Barcelona can't bring anybody new in January because he's going to be sitting on this one-year loan with, not say big wages, because to his credit, and I think why maybe B might even be too low, but he took a pay cut to make it work with Barcelona's FFP. So I don't know. I'm actually almost talking myself into higher than a B here. There's also a circumstance where because of his top quality and what we know he's capable of, this might be an A, A plus move at the end. So B, I don't know. It feels low, but I'm kind of being risk adverse here. If this goes poorly, this could be a D. This could be a disaster because even again with the pay cut he took, he was on big wages at City. So you're still paying him some reasonable wages that you can't bring anybody new in January. And again, if it doesn't work out and he doesn't, just like Hector Bellerin, now Cancelo, a much, much better player than Hector Bellerin throughout his career. But as I said, Cancelo, still a little bit of a risk. Speaking of risk, Xiao Felix, same thing. It's a B just because of the ceiling and the floor of this move. And also because Barcelona for Xiao Felix and Cancelo, due to FFP constraints, meaning if they had had a purchase option that could have counted against this season's FFP. And Barcelona, because again, we're still in the dark about those numbers. I hope to get them figured out over the next few weeks. But until we know what the numbers are, we know that they were already pushing their limit, both with Xiao Cancelo and Xiao Felix, because they did not get a purchase option from Atletico Madrid. And he also renewed his contract with Atletico Madrid for a big number. That means that Barcelona are basically going to say, hey, if this good player winds up being really great for us, we don't reap any of the benefits beyond this season, just the season that we have this year. But they also didn't pay a loan fee, which I know is a huge part of it. So you take a win, you take a loss. That's why I go with a B here, because I think we actually are underrating just how good Xavi Fields could be when he's on his day, when he's feeling it. Look at how good he was now. I mean, we are going back two years already to Atletico Madrid, but the player that arrived from Benfica had a lot of confidence, made a lot of sense, especially in that inverted left winger role that Xavi has. So on paper, there is a world where Xavi Felix, even if you get 85% of the player that he is capable of being, bangs in a few goals, works out with Lewandowski, and I mean, who knows what he's capable of. Again, one year, see how far he can fit in at the club and I mean, Atletico Madrid, I think, again, if he has a good year, they brought him down on his wages, extended that contract very much like Barcelona did with Sami Umtiti. So they would expect to sell him for a pretty big transfer fee that we expect Barcelona will not be able to afford. Regardless of Jorge Mendes getting a really good deal from Juan Laporta. And I don't know, I think it's a show for another time where we talk about the Mendes and Laporta combination and things like that. But also adding Ansu Fati to that triumvirate of Mendes clients being moved on the final days of the transfer deadline in and out of FC Barcelona. Certainly, obviously, we don't even need to say, oh, I'm conspiratorial about it or raise your eyebrows. You see exactly what's happening here. There's a relationship, there's a friendship, and there's some really good players moving in different directions, and Mendes is at the middle of it all. 
I am throwing in Fermi Lopez. He is not going to be registered with the first team. He's still going to be registered with Barca Athletic, where I do still expect him to make the majority of his appearances this season. But he's been on that first team bench. Barcelona never brought in that attacking midfielder. That's not what João Felix is. So that attacking midfielder did not arrive on the final days of the transfer window. So Fermi Lopez still is on paper. What is that? The sixth midfielder? And I would expect him to regularly be within the first team. This one gets an A, probably even A plus, because Linares last season put up those 12 goals in the Spanish third division. I mean, even if he came back and was confident for Barca Athletic, it would have been a win. But he has looked so confident, so good, had a really good preseason. So that's an A for me on this promotion because he's on very, very low wages, even though he just renewed his deal. So you lock him in at 20 years old with a number of years left on his deal. And even if it doesn't work out this year or next year and he wants to spread his wings, now you get some kind of transfer fee for him. So all around, just a terrific piece of business by Barcelona, getting him to extend almost on a team-friendly deal. And for me, Lopez betting on himself and then Barcelona and Xavi being impressed by that and choosing to bet on him as well. Always like to see it. The other promotion, Lamini Mall from the U19s. Give this one an A as well because I did not know if he was going to be ready for this jump up. Just even physically, there were times in the UEFA Youth League last year where you're like, oh, it might take him a year to get accustomed to things. But no, this kid jumped right up, right at home in the first division. And now it's going to be all about how Xavi manages that. But as far as just giving him promotion, well, you look at his talent and the depth that Barcelona now, unfortunately, don't have on their right wing. Looks like a no-brainer, but it looks like he can be the backup all season long, which, yeah, it does scare you. He just turned 16 less than two months ago, and throwing him right into the fire is worrisome. We've seen a lot of young players. It does not work out for them, but... You never know. He might be special. He might just be a very talented player as well. Speaking of teenagers, last one in Vitoroque. This is for January, but it was a 30 mil plus 31 million, which again, basically you combine that to this whole season's thing. That means that 3.4 mil for Romeo was not really what Barca spent in this transfer window. Again, it's 30 mil plus 31 mil in variables. So really it's just that 30 mil that Barcelona is going to be on the hook for until Vitoroque as I've said too, with those variables, he will pay for that 31 mil. Being a Brazilian goal scorer, don't you worry that he is going to pay for himself with that extra 31 mil in variables if he starts to bang in goals the way we expect him to. He'll be arriving in January from Atletico Paranense. Now, Barcelona did ask about it and they said no and totally fair for them. Brazilian calendar is different than the European calendar, so he is playing out his season. It is going to be a lot of football for him in a year. So I would also say come January, don't expect too much. But hopefully by that time, Lewandowski has sorted himself out and Vita Roque can get a few minutes and really next year hit the ground running with a full preseason and a little bit of rest in the summer. I give this one an A because since he even signed that contract, this is looking like a steal. Compared to some of the other young Brazilian deals that have been made recently, 30 mil for a player that is now, when you're talking about goal scoring in Brazil, teenage wise, it's Gabriel Jesus and it's Vita Roque. And that's what you're talking about now with Brazilian football with teenagers. So that is incredibly important for Vita Roque kind of hit the ground running in Europe, almost the way Gabriel Jesus. And you could say, well, it didn't necessarily always work out at Man City, but I mean, Gabriel Jesus had a really darn good career. And if Barcelona are bringing in a player that is anything like the production of Gabriel Jesus and what he brought as a teenager to Man City, then it's not only an A, this is higher than an A, but again, still 30 mil, I mean, that could look like a steal. So I go with an A because again, an A plus doesn't feel like 100%. There is a little bit of risk and that's the only reason why it's an A. All right, now for those who are out. The first one, Antoine Griezmann for 20 mil, Atletico Madrid. It gets a B minus because they finally get his wages off the books, but they also 20 million. They get fleeced again by Atletico Madrid. It just feels like rinse and repeat, yada, 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 yada. Antoine Griezmann, one of the best players in the Liga last year. So yeah, 20 mil almost feels like a steal for Atletico Madrid, but we all knew it never was going to work at Barcelona. And I don't know. I don't want to talk about the sins of Bartomeu again. Until I talk about Trincao, next up, 7 mil plus 50% to Sporting CP. It's a B minus as well, just like Antoine Griezmann, because yeah, they had to eat a huge loss on him, which is frustrating. He could have been something, but I mean, they did. They overpaid for him. It didn't work out. And then you wind up taking a huge loss. And for him, even at Sporting CP, maybe that's his level, but it looks like he always kind of had to be at home in Portugal to figure himself out. And I hope he gets right. And by 25, 26, you see where he goes next. Who knows? So do Busquets, end of his contract. He goes in or by Ami. This is an A because not only for Barcelona, but for him, it was time. It was time for him to go. I had said, if I was Barcelona, I'd probably renew him. 
I mean, who knows? And Oru Mayu seems like he'll be a fine substitution until they can really figure out the long-term plan. And for Sergio Busquets to go to Inter Miami to hang out with Messi and immediately, immediately, when I'm not doing this, you know that I'm around MLS quite a bit. So Sergio Busquets to go to Inter Miami and just not only change that franchise, but change the way that this whole league is being viewed around the world is awesome. So Sergio Busquets to get to continue to watch him for me and to see him take on a project, trying to win in a different location and do it with his homies. Yeah. That's an A for me. I mean, by homies, you know what I mean. Los Amigos. Speaking of Los Amigos, Jordi Alba, that's a contract termination. Now, this one to me is a B plus because Jordi Alba, looking at what he still could have given you and kind of for Barcelona replacing him with Marcus Alonso is not to say a disaster, but not great. Jordi Alba probably had another year left in him at the level that he was playing as, as a backup to Balde, but he didn't want to do that. So it's a B plus because I said for Jordi Alba, it makes sense. And for Barcelona, you know, it is that tough argument where I felt like Jordi Alba, this was a play where they actually, I know people have been saying, oh, he has been dust, done and dusted for years, but this is a play that they actually parted ways with prior to when he was going to be on that huge, huge decline. But they had to do it with a contract termination, not a transfer. So they didn't get any transfer fee for a player that, I mean, still had a bunch left to give in Europe, which, yeah, is frustrating. I say B+, because, again, I'm giving Jordi Alba some of that number, but if you just said, based on Barcelona's side of this deal, that might even be a CC-. minus. But again, I'm being wishy-washy on it, because you do wind up parting with Jordi Alba, and if the club and the player felt like it was time, then it was time. Seeing him contract terminations, A for Sammy Umtiti, because, yes, he's no longer on the Barcelona book, so you are able to move his wages, and because he'd agreed to extend his contract out so he could get a move, that being last year, this has been important for him. He goes to Lille, where he's a fourth choice center back, and he's not going to play a lot, but still, for him to be in who should be expected to be a top five team in France this season and to just be a depth piece, a rotation piece, and who knows how much he'll play and how important he'll be. But Umtiti, yeah, I would love to see him continue to turn his career around a bit. I mean, he's still in his 20s. He still has time. So this gets an A for me for both the move, for the contract termination, and to finally Umtiti, it was time for a new day for him. And to see from all parties to have a new day is great. Alex Callado goes on a free with a plus 25% on a sell-on fee to Real Betis, which gives me a C plus because didn't go to Real Betis, continued on. Yes, he's a Real Betis player, but he continued on to Al Akdud in Saudi Arabia. So it's a C plus because I just, I don't know what he's doing at 24 at this point in his career. These transfers out aren't necessarily grades for Barcelona, but grades in total for the player and both teams. And that's kind of how I'm grading these. What kind of move is this? So it is C plus for me. So he goes to another team in Spain where with LJ he was good last year. Thought he'd continue his career, but I mean, he went for the paydays. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too cynical about the C+. Maybe that can go up. But for Barcelona, just get a free plus 25%. I mean, I guess so. But again, going to Saudi Arabia isn't going to raise his stock for Barcelona if Real Betis try to sell him on. I don't know yet. We're still too early in the Saudi Arabian market for teams to see if they're going to go to the Saudi Arabia teams and offer money to get those players and bring them back to Europe. We haven't seen what that market looks like yet. So this C plus could wind up being wrong. Is a star over in Saudi Arabia, and then some other team in the Premier League, whoever, want to buy him up, and Barcelona get 25% of that. So that's going to be a nice little payday there. But at the moment, it's a C plus. Nico Gonzalez is an 8.5 mil plus 40% plus a repurchase to Porto. It's a B for me just because of the money you're seeing thrown around in the Saudi Arabian League and the EPL. If Nico Gonzalez had come up through the Manchester United or Chelsea or whoever, or, or West Ham or Brighton, he probably would have went for 30 mil. So, I mean, it's a B because you wind up having to sell Nico Gonzalez on, and he still could be a very good player. But I also understand Barcelona feel like they have a ton of center midfielders. And I've also mentioned, too, they have a bunch of prospects also coming up that are 15, 16, 17, and already pushing into Barca Athletic. So you are looking at what feels like a golden generation. And Nico Gonzalez was just a step below when it came to Gabi and Pedri. And, I mean, who knows about Fermin Lopez? But, yeah, it just felt like Nico Gonzalez was a step below them. And it's fine for Barcelona. You took the 8.5 mil, 40% on add-on to Porto, who is a selling club as well, who usually do get fair money for their players. So that's a pretty good hefty number for Barcelona later on down the road. And if he does wind up becoming a star at Porto, you'll see him in the Champions League this year. You get a repurchase option. So that's why that's a B for me. Paulo Torre, loan to Girona. I, again, think Girona is a really good place for these young players to grow, not only because they're in Catalonia, I mean, Pablo Torre is not from Catalonia, so it's not a thing. Remember, he's from Racing Santander up there in the north. While it's not home to Catalonia, 
Girona basically have a starting 11 plus one or two that they can trust. And then the rest of the minutes and spots and even one injury means they're playing a player that gets an opportunity. He picked up a knock in preseason, but has still come off the bench in all three games so far this season. And while I don't see him as a consistent starter, again, Girona are very confident with the starters. I don't think he's unsettling Alex Garcia anytime soon, but I do think that Pablo Torre is going to get minutes and opportunities that he definitely would not have gotten at Barcelona this year. So he goes on loan. It's an A- minus for me. I don't see how next season or the season after you have both Pablo Torre and Fermin Lopez in the first team, but if this is a successful loan for him at Girona and Fermin Lopez, we see how he does in the first team. Now you're saying, hey, whichever of these players takes that step forward, because they both are the same age at 20, next season go with the one that made the most sense. And that becomes your guaranteed, even improved upon, six midfielder. Still working through this, Julian Araujo, alone to Las Palmas. A minus for me, because he went from the bench to 45 minutes to the full 90 in the first three games. So that seems like a good start. And just like Girona, Las Palmas does not have the depth to not play Julian Araujo. So again, an A minus for me, because he went from being a starter at the LA Galaxy. I mean, maybe even playing with Barca Athletic, but that felt like a too low of a level for him. But Barcelona, the first team was definitely too high low for him. He had not adjusted to playing for that club yet. And so Las Palmas playing under Garcia Pimienta is a good opportunity for him to figure out some of the positional play because Garcia Pimienta does play a similar way to Barcelona in terms of just the standards of positional play and what he wants to see from his right back. So if Juan Araujo can impress Garcia Pimienta by playing in that way and playing in that style and maybe inverting a little bit and testing himself in the European game in Spain, then who knows what Barcelona get. Again, they're still looking for a right back, and that's not going to change because Cancelo, again, is just a year of a loan. Frank Kessie, 12.5 to El Ali in Saudi Arabia. This move, it's tough. I understood they had to get him off the books. I understood it was a matter of this player accepted to leave, accepted that he wasn't going to be a starter the way he would have wanted to be, I think. And he didn't even push for the move. Barcelona asked him, and he went to help their wage bill, and he kind of did the club a favor. C feels low. But also 12.5 million feels low for a player in his prime. So it's on to Usmani Dembele. C plus for this one too. Goes to PSG for 50 mil. Yeah, I mean, I think for Barcelona and Xavi, he would have liked to keep him. And then once it became quite clear that they would lose him next summer for a free, maybe C plus is a bit too harsh because they did get a transfer fee for Usmani Dembele. But as I said, you don't get him this season. You don't get that talent. And yeah, I know he was probably going to miss a third or half of the games, but still. Usmane Dembele was a profile that Xavi felt was essential to the way he wanted to build his team. And to not have that, you could already see what's happening with Robert Lewandowski, not having that player on the right who consistently takes attention away from him. And so he doesn't have to contend with all the center backs all at the same time. So Usmane Dembele losing that player who creates the double on the right is a problem. And so that's why I give this on a C plus because Barcelona did not want to lose him, but it would have gone lower if not for that 50 million that they got from PSG. From PSG to PSV, it's Sergino Desk alone, plus 10 mil buy option, plus a sell on. This one is a B and maybe even higher. He walked right into the starting lineup. And if it was actually just a permanent transfer and not a loan, it would have been an A. But the fact that he is already looking like he could revive his career in the Netherlands, I don't think he'll ever play for Barcelona. As I said, like Juan Araujo, I think, has a higher chance of playing for Barcelona, even though, as you've heard me say, I think Sergino Des, especially because of what he can do as an attacking player, has a much higher ceiling than Julian Araujo. But again, a $10 million buy option with a sell-on. Again, he didn't cost that much when he originally arrived at the club. So after all these years of things not working out, I think that's actually just fine. A B for that move. So you know, Dest, yeah, keep doing your thing. Play well for the U.S. men's national team. You know, that'll make me a little happy. And that's all I expect out of Shadino Dest. Just revive his career at home, not at PSV. Remember, he came up through Ajax. So the rival in PSV, PSV, return to Netherlands, may make sense for him. Clement Langley alone to Aston Villa. This one gets an A-. minus. I was talking to one of my good friends who is an Aston Villa fan. And he's actually pretty, not say excited about that transfer, but I did tell him, Clement Langley his stock around world football and the way we talk about him. Not say it's too low, but he was fine for Tottenham last year. And he was fine for Barcelona. He just made a few too many errors, had one bad season. And then obviously at the Camp Nou, you know, once something goes wrong, it's always going to go wrong for you. And he actually, with his talent, would have been much, much easier to move on and already be sold at this point if his wages weren't so high through the Bartomeu contract. So again, this is an A- minus because he doesn't go to Saudi Arabia, which again, I guess you don't get that transfer fee. But I think for Clement Langley, I give us an A- because he gets to go to Premier League and go to Aston Villa. And if this works out, then I think that they buy him or somebody else in the EPL is going to buy him. 
I think Clement Lenglet is too good to come back to Barcelona and be a scourge on their wages. I think we're kind of done with that. And he'll be even closer to the end of his contract. And you're going to be able to move him. He's still in his late 20s. Still has a lot to give as a center back. I like that move for him to Aston Villa. And that means I like that move for Barcelona because that's an asset that may be able to prove himself in a top six team in the Premier League. And if he winds up being a contributor, just like with Tottenham last year, in a top six team in the Premier League, you're in a good spot for Barcelona. Ansu Fati, here's the big one. This is the big out. This is the one that's going to make the biggest headlines. It's an A. It's a loan to Brighton, meaning Brighton cannot buy him. He will be returning to Barcelona as some kind of player next year. Is it one that has revived himself? If he's going to do it with anybody in world football, you do trust that it's the Zerbi to get him where he needs to be. I was having a little conversation about whether or not Brighton are incentivized to play him. I don't really think they are because with wages that the Premier League clubs are willing to spend, he doesn't make an outrageous amount. Like He makes an outrageous amount for what he was producing for Barcelona based on the FFP restrictions that they have. But if Barcelona are back to the Camp No and huge gate revenue and everything is working and sponsors and yada yada, and they're making the knockouts of the Champions League, then his wages are not outrageous at what is reported at about 13.5. For Brighton, though, if they're going to pay his full wages this season, they're a little bit incentivized to play him based on those wages, but they're more incentivized to play him because you watch him in training and Xavi says the same thing. Like, this kid's really special, but clearly game-wise, he's not totally back to where he needs to be. But for Barcelona's sake, for his sake, for Brighton's sake, this is an A. Brighton get a young talent with a very, very, very high ceiling this season, even if he can get him to scoring goals again. For Barcelona, Ansu Fati, again, he's still just 20. So even if physically he's not going to be all that he might have been before all his injuries, if he has a good year at Brighton, he spits right back into the first team and becomes an exception to that rule. Very rarely, as we know, do players go on loan prior to breaking in, as in you broke in, you go on loan. It, it just doesn't work that way. You don't come back and, and it works out. There's no loan right in the middle of a career. There are some examples, and please hit me with some of those so I can use those as examples on the podcast and shout you out and give you credit for them. But not many examples, especially in FC Barcelona's history. But yeah, I think this is an A because this could be the exception to the rule. And also, he was 16 when he came up. He had huge, huge injuries that could have derailed his career, and he's still just 20. He was given the number 10 shirt by Barcelona. That sounds like a gosh darn exception to me, and I'm really hoping that he is, in all the positive ways now in his career, an exception to all this. So a loan without a buy option is awesome for Barcelona. They're also, that being Brighton, paying his full wages, so Barcelona have him off the books for this year. And yeah, they made those other decisions to bring in other players. I don't know if Jao Felix is, is a better case scenario than Ansu Fati, but hey, if you get a good year out of Jao Felix on loan and you know you're losing him for nothing next summer, but Ansu Fati returns a better version of himself, then that is a win-win situation for Barcelona. Football doesn't always work that way, but again, you can dream. Eric Garcia alone to Girona, another A for me. I expect him to be the third center back behind Daly Blind and David Lopez, but Deli Blind has had a ton of injuries in his career over the last few years. He's pretty long in the two. So Eric Garcia could be a regular starter for Girona, who finishing, I believe, 10th last year in the Liga, are expecting to be even higher. And they've been a good team to start this season. So I have high hopes for Eric Garcia and this loan. I mean, I, I think at this point he goes out and... I mean, Enrique Martinez is 32 years old, though. So you really don't know where his future lies at the club. Now we're going to see probably a lot of Pau Gubarsi making the bench for Barcelona, if not playing. But I don't know. It's an A because it's a good move for Barcelona to get him off the books if he wanted to go. He didn't make that much, though, so I don't think it really hurts them. But any little bit, it seems like, if Xiao Cancelo was taking a pay cut, that tells me that every little bit, so even the reported 3.5 to 5 mil that Eric Garcia was making on the wage bill, to move him off the wage bill so they could register Cancelo and Xiao Felix, then I guess that's a good thing. And in the case of Eric Garcia, this is a good spot for him, I think, to get his career back on track. And I mean, there are things with the ball that he does, as I always say, in Xavi's system that make sense if he could figure out how to defend. And he's still a young defender, so he could still learn a few things. And if he learns some new tricks at Girona as a regular starter, get some confidence, I mean, who knows where his future might hold at Barcelona. Remember, it's a lot easier for a player to quote-unquote return home to Catalonia, a player from Barcelona's academy than it is for a player to come in and not really know how things are. Like Eric Garcia could immediately come back to Barcelona, a better player, and fit right back in. Abde, out to Real Betty, 7.5 mil, plus 50% of a sell-on, plus a repurchase option. And it's not the worst thing, not the best thing. 
I don't think it's great to lose that profile. And I'm not sure where Barcelona and Xavi, if you get one injury to your forwards before Vitor Roque shows up in January, I don't see where you're getting or who you're getting those extra minutes from. I'm even in the youth academy. I guess you're bringing those players up. But winger-wise, it's kind of bare compared to the midfielders and some of the center backs in the academy right now, particularly the attacking midfielders. There's a ton of those. And you're going to push those out to the wing. So I don't know. Maybe Xavi really is 100% going in and saying, I don't care. Like, I'm not going to use Abde. And I mean, Evan Ansu and Ferran Torres are playing in the middle, not on the left wing. So maybe Xavi just said, the left winger is Alonso and Balde. My left back is my left winger. That's how this is working. That's the system I want. So Abde, we don't really have a place for you because I'm always going to use an attacking midfielder, even a Fermin Lopez or Gabi, whoever, Jao Felix. I'm going to use those players over you at that spot. So Abde saw the writing on the wall, said, all right, let me try to you know become a better player. I, at 7.5 mil with a repurchase that I've heard is like 20 mil, I don't see him ever returning. So I do give this one a C plus because I do think that Barcelona should have taken another year to kind of figure out what they had. But again, I also understand why the player doesn't want that. Real Betis, I mean, he'll have his chances, but I also don't think he's going to be a consistent starter. And at that point, he's going to be, what, 22, 23? So it's not like he's a young, young player anymore. Remember, he kind of came to the academy as a 19-year-old from Hercules. It was a great piece of business to get him for 2 mil. He clearly was worth more than that. But to get just 7.5 mil when you're seeing some of those other numbers being thrown around, that is a we'll say Real Betis friendly transfer fee, another team that can barely afford anybody and barely got everybody registered. So I don't know, not a great move for me to Real Betis. Believe it or not, I love when players go to Real Betis, just like Girona. They're one of the teams that I think play football in in an enjoyable way. And I think players can get better at those clubs. But I think the nature of financially, at least of this deal, I don't know, could be better. 50% sell on though. That's pretty good. Whatever. There's also a 50% sell on. Speaking of Real Betis still, Chadi Riyad, 2.5 mil with a buyback clause. It's a C for me. Has not played yet. And you would have expected that he'd want to play. And I just don't see if there's going to be that many minutes for him, barring some injuries at Real Betis. So don't really like the move. I mean, I like the fact that his friend Abde is there, both players from the Moroccan national team. But Chadi Riyad could have done better for him in that kind of move. But sometimes it takes the next move after that. Look at Mika Marmol. Went to Andorra. Made a lot of sense for him from Barca Athletic. Then on to Las Palmas, where he's already started a game. Looked pretty good. So you never know. He could even go on loan in January from Real Petis and get his career back on track. He is still in his early 20s, so I'm not too worried about him. Asanas Pedrola, who just did turn 20, went to Sampdoria in the Serie B, which I know that usually Sampdoria is in the first division, but not this year. It is a loan with a 3 million buy clause plus 50% sell-on plus a buyback clause. Again, just turned 20. This is a B plus for me because he became an instant starter. He already has a goal in three games. So he goes to Serie B, and if Sampdoria, who should feel like they're one of the favorites to get promoted back to the first division, if they get promoted back to the first division and Sampdoria, for some reason or another, has to part with him, and if they get back to the first division, three million buy clause or obligation clause, they're, you know they're going to have to buy that anyway. And even if they have to sell him on, because let's say they don't make it and they have to sell him on for 50% of that, hey, if he scored some goals and was a good player, he can be bought by somebody else. And then Barcelona still have that buyback clause as well. So this one's a B plus for me. I like this move for Asanas Pedrola because he became a starter, already scored a goal. And I feel like the second division in Italy, for a team like Sampdoria, though, who has some first division talent and is going to be fighting in a pressure situation to get back there, I think it's a good move for him. Same thing with Alex Valle, B plus for this one as well. Goes on loan to Levante, jumps right into the starting lineup. He's a 19-year-old left back that, hey, if you think Marcos Alonso stinks, then maybe at 20, Alex Valle can back up Balde. And I feel like, yeah, you're scared of two young fullbacks. But at that point, you'll have Valle with two years or a year and a half, if you will, of being a starter for a second division team. And who knows? Again, Levante would love to come back to the first division. So you have a player who would be a year and a half starter for a team in Spain in the first or second division in Valle. And you have Balde at that point next season, who'll be in his third year of being a starter for FC Barcelona. And so I'm not necessarily that worried of them being 20 years old next year. It's not going to be a concern to me. Well, Balde does turn 20 in October. Valle more recently turned 19. But so having a 21-year-old and a 20-year-old next year, again, it would be worrisome. But at that point, they'll have a combined four and a half or close to five years of first-team football under their belt. And that could happen. So Valle, I like the move for him. Picking up the pace to end this. I know I talk fast anyway, but let's get this done. Coming in, Noah Darvitz, 2.5 mil, the 16-year-old from Freiburg. 
two in the third Liga, that being the third division in Germany. This is a B plus for me. I like this move because he is just like Lamine Mall was one of the special players at the Euro U 17s. So for Barcelona to get him and bring him in for 2.5, this is a deal that could have been six or seven really with do you see the numbers that players are going for. I feel like they got him a year and a year and a half earlier than they might have. So, I mean, he definitely has a higher ceiling than some of the other young players that they brought in, like a Yusuf Demir, who was supposed to be with the B team, but he jumped right to the first team because they had to have him in there, which is kind of unfair for him. And I hope this one at 16 works out a bit better. But he also, I feel like, has a higher ceiling too. You talk to people who regularly are around the German game, and they really like him. Noah Darvitz, 2.5 mil, nice move for Barcelona, B+. Plus. Could even raise to an A, or obviously, if he's a future superstar, this one's going to rise. Mika Faye, 1.5 mil. It's a B for me. He's a 19-year-old left-footed center back from the second division in Croatia, but he wasn't there long. Remember, he was only there a few months, having come from Senegal. And B might even be a little bit low. With Barcelona now feeling like they're short on center backs and three of the four being pretty injury-prone, Mika Faye could be a part of the first team sooner than we know. I think he's going to take a little bit of time to refine his game. Six months in the second division in Croatia is not enough time against big competition. Like, you truly have to be a one in a million special prodigy to be able to hit the ground running like that. But as I said, 19 year old left footed center back, some of the physical tools you already see, the speed, the strength, some of that stuff is already there. And I hope to see him become a regular starter, get all that bureaucracy stuff done and dusted, and be the regular starter for Barca Athletic under Rafa Marquez. Learn from one of the best that have done it over the last 20 years at that position, figure it all out. And then who knows where his future is in the first team next year, becoming a competition, I think, again, in the preseason. Barca Athletic did sign a bunch of other players that I don't really have grades for. Diego Perkin, Trilli, Edu Sanchez, Gerard Martin. Those are some of the names that I just want you to know out there for Barca Athletic. But it's hard to tell who's going to be the starter and who isn't when you're talking about players who are coming from the other teams in the third division or fourth division or all. I mean, Perkin, 21, Trilli, 20. Edu Sanchez, 18, from uh, Badajoz, and Martin is 21, coming from Cornea. So you don't really know what you're getting with those kind of players. In previous years that we talked about Barca Athletic, those players were 23, 24, and you kind of had a little more of an idea of who they were. So I'm interested to see these young players even coming in. Is Trilli going to start over Hector Fort, who's 17 and should be or can expect it to be? Barcelona's right back of the future if they are really following that progression. Is he going to be the one to start, or is Hector Fort going to be U19 slash Barca Athletic and be the backup to Trilli? We don't know. Trilli took an early injury, but as I said, with these players who are still technically really young in their career coming to Barca Athletic, I mean, they also could play well, then get sold a year later. This happens a lot, so I'm not truly attaching myself to any of these players, but even Edu Sanchez is 18, so let's worry about him in two, three, four years' time. He's clearly not bought for a lot of money, and we'll see what he can do. The last player here to worry about coming in, Mamadou Fall, loan with a 7 million purchase option plus add-ons. Coming from LAFC here in MLS, so obviously I am familiar with him. He's made 42 appearances for LAFC in the previous two years prior to last season, so it's not like he's an unknown commodity. He is still 20 years old, and he's a center back who is right-footed, and he had a fine loan in the second division with Villarreal Bay last season, making one appearance for the first team. That's not enough, and I totally understand why he would say, hey, Villarreal, I thought I'd get my chances. I didn't. Now I'm taking my chance at Barcelona, which is pretty crazy too. Fall could be the guy instead of Faye. Again, Faye could get the time to refine his game. And maybe Eric Garcia was even told, hey, we are willing to let you go because we are going to give Mamadou Fall some more opportunities. This one gets a C plus for me because I, I just, again, having watched him, I don't see entirely how he's going to fit in with what Xavi expects from his center backs. I think he's okay with the ball. He's pretty good in the air. But he's a center back that does use some of his physical tools and is not as reactive as Xavi expects his team to be. So I am a little worried in seeing him if he has to play in the first division against a high line. Bart's athletic to that point too. It's a C plus because I think that's higher in the third division. He was in the second division last year with Villarreal Bay. So to go to Bart's athletic in the third division is a step down for him. Same thing with LAFC. LAFC is way higher of a level in MLS than playing in the third division with Barca Athletic. So I think he's going to be a regular in the first team because if not, I, this move just makes no sense from that player. And also, if you're going to spend $7 million next year on a purchase option, you don't do that with a player who only has tape of the third division. That just doesn't happen, including those add-ons too. Once again, 20 years old already, and I say already because he's played a lot of first division football already for Villarreal Bay and LAFC over the last three years. So if you're going to spend $7 mil, plus add-ons for a purchase option after this loan, that means he would have had to break in the first team. I just don't see any other way. 
Real quick, lastly, because we are talking now about Barca Athletic exits, A- minus for a 700K sale of Fabio Blanco. Came in from Frankfurt, high profile, but did well with the Spanish youth team. So expected some things of him, but never really worked out. Goes to Villarreal Bay in the second division. So again, A- minus for him, but it looks like he's going to play there as well. So to make that jump from the third division to the second division in Spain and for Barcelona to get 700K out of that transfer, that's fine by me. A- minus for that deal. Ana Tanas, a free to PSG. C minus. I mean, for him, he just swapped out sitting on the bench at Barcelona to sitting on the bench at PSG. I don't know. Maybe he'll be the regular backup there instead of the third goalkeeper. And comes the timing as well. Iñaki Pena was continuing to stick around. And when I saw Arnaud Tanas at 17, 18, 19, I really thought he could have been a future goalkeeper for Barcelona. Even undersized, he just has tremendous reflexes, plays the ball well with his feet. But the timing was never going to make sense. And he certainly, I think, in development-wise, has stalled the last year or two not getting really, truly regular first-team minutes. And I think at this point, you do worry that he's destined to just be a backup. And at some point, it's not going to be Barcelona and PSGs. He will continue to fall down the ladder as the years go on. Ilash Komash went for free to Villarreal. He is still just 19 years old. And I give this an A because, yes, Barcelona lost him on the free. But this is a really good move for the player. And this is one where I'm giving the grade for the player and Villarreal picking up this move more than I am for Barcelona. So yes, they were always going to lose him on the free, but I really like this move. He stays in Spain where he's comfortable, goes to Villarreal, and it already looks like he is going to play off the bench. Which again, at just 19, to become their fifth or sixth forward is a really good spot for him. And hey, I think he could be a good professional. And so I like this move for him. I like this move for Villarreal. And for Barcelona, yeah, not every player works out. Not every contract timeline works out. He wasn't scoring as much as they needed him to. Xavi, in the first game of his managerial career at Barcelona, called up Ilasha Komas and gave him a start in that very first match. And it didn't really work out. Again, he wasn't putting the ball in the back of the net like you have to have your right forward do. And he wasn't creating enough goals either, especially at the top level, to trust him in the long run. So yeah, you lose out on a transfer fee, but not that big of a deal in A for me. Gustavo Maye also leaves for free. This one just as a transaction. I mean, it was another Bartomeu thing. They spent way too much money on him. You take your chances. You roll the die with these Brazilian kids. I just, I never felt like the reports coming out on him for Brazil. He wasn't ever considered one of those wonderkins. It felt like Barcelona were really stretching on one of those diamonds in a rough. And even at five mil, whatever he was bought for, that was already a bit too big for the reports that were coming out. He was a teenager then, but now he goes to Villanova FC in Serie Bay. It's a B minus because that transfer fee that Barcelona had to eat, he didn't even give you something for Barca Athletic. I mean, that's how off the level he was, that even Barca Athletic could not utilize him, which is rough. Victor Barbera is the last one. I mean, there were, again, there were a bunch of outros, but these are the ones I'm focusing on. It's a C minus to Club Bruges because the player that was playing for Barca Athletic I mean, I would love for them to have extended his contract for a year or two, sent him out on a loan next year, and then sold him because he was scoring goals last year. And I think he probably could have got a fee if they could have extended his deal. Also totally understand why he didn't want to do that and just wanted to go play somewhere else. He basically decided he was going to go to Club Bruges back in, what was it, February or March. So he didn't even feature for Barcelona much for the rest of the spring because they decided, well, I mean, we already know you're, you're leaving. We want to give opportunities to kids who are going to be sticking around. So a C minus all around too, because he's not even looking like he's going to be a regular player and feature regularly for Club Bruges' first team. So for him to go from the third division in Spain to the second division in Belgium or wherever he's going to be playing or in their youth teams, it doesn't seem like a good move for the player. Who knows? Who knows? Listen, I could eat crow on this one in a few weeks or months if as the Belgian league really does get in full swing, if he winds up making the team and being a part of it. But I'm saying the early prognosis for this on the Belgian division getting started the way it is it doesn't look like he's going to feature in their first team. And if I was Victor Barrera, I mean, again, I could have gone on on loan somewhere in the second division or whatever, maybe Andorra or whatever. But because I didn't choose to do that and I went for the free to Club Bruges, if it doesn't work out for him in the first division in Belgium, then I mean, you immediately have halted two or three years of your career when, again, he's just 19, 20 years old. And that's a concern for me. So a C minus, unfortunately for him, he showed a lot of promise and is a good striker that I feel like with the proper time and care, he could turn into a pretty good player. All right, talking about Victor Barbera, it does mean that the show is absolutely over. This was so long. Thank you for being with me this entire time. Keep referencing this. Go back. Let this be your manifesto for the rest of the season as to where this player went or what happened here. So 501 had to be a big one after 500. I appreciate everyone for being with me. And as always, until next time, Forza Barca. Barca.